Well, welcome. Today we're going to be covering the Guide to Computer Forensics Investigations. This is the sixth edition. The material all comes from Cengage. They own and control all copyright material. I am just providing video lectures on the individual chapters for my courses using this textbook. My name is Arthur Salman, and I'm going to be working with you throughout this book. Thank you. Chapter 7, Linux and Macintosh File System. So here we're going to be looking at these two specific machines. So we're going to be looking at the Linux file structure and the Mac file structure. We're also going to be looking at generically using Linux forensics tools. So that means we need to examine the Linux file structure. It was based off of Unix. And this is the Silicon Graphics Inc. SGI, Santa Cruz, uh, Sun Solar, IBM, HP. These are all common distributions of Linux. There's still like Ubuntu and Red Hat and Kali and many, many more. So when we're looking at Linux distributions, that's where Kali, that's where Red Hat, that's where Cent, Mint, Dora, Ubuntu, all of those come in. Linux is only the core part of the operating system. Both of these have similarities. All Unix-like OSs have a kernel. That same thing is true in all Windows operating systems. All operating systems typically have a kernel that manages the components of the software. Some important things to remember is Unix and Unix are very case sensitive. Desktop with a capital D is different from desktop with a lowercase d. Wrong capitalization means your commands are not going to be accepted. So review some of the Linux commands and we work through the activities in our textbook. The overall file structure in X4 is going to be the most newest. This means we can support large Partition file sizes, 16 terabytes or larger. With the third iteration, basically uh, it got additional features over 2, because 2 is the earlier version. But as we've grown and our storage devices have grown, we've needed additional features. So XT4 is the most common one as it relates to Linux distributions right now. They will improve management of large individual files, more flexibility. While the adoption of XT4 was slower on some distributions, it is pretty common now. Now considering the standard file size of more of the, the common distributions, this is the now base requirement for working with large individual files. And keep in mind, you can have a two, three terabyte image file easily and you can now have you know 12 14 16 18 terabyte storage devices so xt4 is pretty common because of the large file sizes and drive sizes now so when we say file what exactly does that mean in linux everything is a file every object has properties, has a method. So a folder is a file. A data file is a file. Everything is a file. In the Linux file system, it does consist of four main components. The boot block, this contains the bootstrap code. Basically, this is where the Linux computer only has the one uh, boot block, and this is located on the main disk. The second area is the super block, and this is specifies the disk geometry, the available space, uh, all of the track of all the inodes. It manages the overall file system. It handles the physical space and the physical layout of the disk. We have our inode blocks, and this is the first data after the super block. And this is assigned to every file allocation unit. This is how we can do data file analysis this is how we would find data files because again the inode block is assigned to every file allocation unit 
Next is our data blog. This is where directories and files are actually stored on a disk. This location is linked directly to the inodes. So let's try, dig into inodes a little bit more in depth. An inode contains file and directory metadata. It also links the data to the stored portion of the data blocks. The data blocks is where the actual file is housed, but the attributes, the uh, metadata, all the extra components is stored in the inode. When we assign an inode contains basically the mode, the type of the file or directory, the number of links, the graphical ID, the, the UID of the, the owner, number of bytes in the file or directory, file or directory last access time and modified time, all of that is part of the metadata for a individual data file and or directory. Because again, everything is a file, so directories are uh, located and treated just as a file is. So continuing on with that line of thought, inodes also are assigned things like the last file status change time, block address for all the file data components, indirect, double indirect, triple indirect block addresses for the file data. So again, we want to look at all of the chunks of the data, current usage status of the inode, number of actual blocks assigned to a specific file. That way, if you know there are 200 blocks, you can look at the direct, double indirect, triple indirect block addresses to identify where all of the data components for that block are. And all of that stored in the inode. Uh, file generation numbers, version numbers, uh, continuation inode links, all of the link components are stored in the inode. That way, the, the data as a whole is contiguous. You, you know where all of the chunks of the data actually is. So let's look at some more details of the inode. First, the inode has 13 pointers. Pointers 1 through 10 are the direct pointers to the data storage block. That's where the data is actually stored in block. Uh, pointer 11 is an indirect pointer. Basically, this will link to 128 pointer inodes so that there are directly to those 128 blocks. Pointer 12 is a double indirect, and pointer 13 is a triple indirect. So let's look at this a little more in depth. So this is what it meant by our double indirect and triple indirect. So pointer 12 goes here, goes to other locations, and then the data. Point 13 goes to one. That's split up into other data points. That goes into other data points. And then the data. So this is the double. This is the triple because here's one, two, and three before it gets to the actual data component. So there's also something called the bad block inode. Basically, this will keep track of the disk's bad sectors of the physical medium. To find the bad blocks on a Linux computer, you can use the bad block command, and this will log in as a root user. We also have things like the uh, MKE2FS or the E2 file uh, check scan. This will include safeguards that prevent them from overwriting important data while checking on uh, to make sure it's bad cluster, they're bad uh, sectors. So there are hard links and symbolic links. A hard link is a pointer that allows access to the same file, but by different names. You can use the ln command to create a hard link. So that is slightly different than a symbolic link. So let's look at this. So a hard link might actually reference the same sector, but by different file names. That's a hard link. 
So there is a link count as well, and that's basically a field inside each inode that will specify the number of hard links. Again, if we do a ls with attack a, we can see certain structure. We can see the dot dot and the single dot, basically the dot dot parent directory. A single dot is a current directory. So you can navigate. Not sure what that has to do with hard links, but it was more of a, that was a slide they threw in there. So let's get back to symbolic links. A symbolic link is also called a soft link or a sys link. Basically, this will point to other files that aren't included in the link count. Yet yeah, they can point to an item on the other drive and they can act like it's something close, even though it really isn't. Having the, an inode of their own, not the same as an inode of the item that they're pointing to, this will basically depend on the existence of the destination and what you're pointing to. So here we have a system link, and the system link is a current directory that is really pointed to a different directory, but it will act like it is the current directory. And symbolic links are actually in all operating systems. You can actually do a symbolic link where it's, for example, like on a Windows machine, where it points to a, a D drive in a different directory, but you can have it linked to a folder on the C drive, and it will actually act and pretend as if it was truly a folder on the C drive. So again, that's a soft link. So moving on, let's talk about the Mac or the Apple file system. So there are, it's not, we're not at 10.13 anymore. I'm pretty sure it's 10.16, but Mac OS keeps updating. And as it grows, it gets newer features, better performance. Mac OS is uh, moving to an, it did move to an Intel based process and it becomes more Unix based. Before OS X, we had what's called the HFS file system, the hierarchy of file system. Well, after a little while, we got the extended file system or HFS plus. Well, in anything above version 10, the modern day, Apple OS, which has been around for the last like 10, 12 years, we get the Apple file system or APFS. And this was introduced in High Sierra. And basically when data is written to a device, there's also metadata that's copied around to help with crash protection. So with the APFS, it's not just the data files, but there's other components that are moved along with each individual data file. So let's look at this a little bit more in depth. In Mac, a file consists of two components, the data fork and a resource fork. The, this stores the file metadata and application information. The data fork typically will have data that the user creates, text documents, spreadsheets, PDFs, and so forth. Applications are also read and write into the data forks where the resource blocks will contain information such as menus and dialog boxes. So more of the applications are focused on the resource blocks. User generated file content is a data fork. A volume is any storage medium used to store files. It can be all part partial of any type of storage media. Here we have data and a resource fork. Each individual file will have both a data fork and a resource fork. So all of the menu options and uh, menu dialog uh, sections, all of that's part of the resource fork. The data that the end user will interact with will be part of the data fork. So let's look more at a volume. A volume has allocated and logical blocks. Logical blo uh, blocks typically are in the 512 byte range. Allocation blocks are a set of consecutive logical blocks. So we have our in the file 
could be a logical in the file, that's the actual ending of a file, or we're going to have a physical in the file, that's the number of bytes allotted on the volume. So here is a perfect example. We could have logical blocks that make up a file because, let me grab my pen. These blocks make up file A. We can also say these files are part of an allocated block. These two files make up file B, so they are allocated block 1, and so forth. So this is these four files, 1, 2, 3, 4, yep allocated block 2. All of the other ones unallocated. So we can have a combination. Here is a slightly different view. Allocated blocks versus logical blocks. Logical blocks are going to be individual chunks of data. Again, 512 bytes large. And then an allocated block will be any combination of all of the logical blocks that make up the data file. So there are some other terms such as our clump. And these are basically a group of contiguous allocated blocks. This helps with the reduction of fragmentation of data files. Older Macintoshes also use logical blocks, one, 0 and 1, as boot blocks. We also have our, our master directory block or our volume information block. They store information about the volume itself. We also have a control block for the volume and that stores information from the master directory block when the OS is actually mounted. Current operating systems, OS is always mounted, but some of the older ones you can unmount and whatnot. That's outside the scope of this. There's also the extended overflow file, and that will store any file information that's not in either the MBD or VCB. There are other things like our catalog, and that will list all of the files, and that includes data files and directories on the specific volume. They will maintain the relationship between all of the objects, files, and directories. We also have what's called a B tree file system in earlier versions of Max. This is actually where the data is stored on the leaf node. Basically the B tree also uses the headers, indexes, and map nodes to store data files. Again, that was fairly old, so you may not encounter that, but that is legacy. There are some differences between Linux and Mac OS. Linux uses the home username and root directories. In Mac, the folders are users username instead of home and private var root as opposed to just the root directory. The home directory exists in the Mac OS, but it does have nothing in it. Mac users have limited access to other user accounts and the guest account is disabled where in Linux you have some additional controls over other users. So why is this relevant? Like why did we talk about Linux and Mac OS's? That's because for the forensics procedures in the different operating systems you need to know where the file system components are located and how both core operating systems function. How are the data is stored on the drives? Application settings, understanding where the user data is, things like that. So for the forensics procedure on a Mac, application settings are in three formats. Plain text, plist files, and SQLite database files. The plist files are basically preference files or installed applications on a system. There's also the file vault, which is used for encrypting and decrypting users and the user directory. In a Mac, there's also keychains, and this is where files are used to manage passwords for applications and all types of other core features around password management. The Mac application keychain access will enable you to restore passwords on Apple-based devices. Deleted files are in the trash folder. If a file is deleted at the command terminal, 
it doesn't show up in the trash bin. So that is something that's common between multiple versions of operating systems, but you do need to keep that in mind that the trash bin, while it's a temporary holder, anything done at the terminal typically bypasses that. Similar to all other operating systems, when we're talking acquisition for a Mac, you will make a image of the drive. We are removing the drive from the Mac typically is not as easy as it sounds. It's nowhere near as easy as it is in a Windows machine. So Mac Minis or MacBooks, all of the drive removal process is actually very difficult. So attempting to do so without Apple factory training, you can do some serious damage to the machine. Also difficult for MacBook Airs, you do need specialized hardware. We can use a Mac OS compatible forensics boot drive or live disk to make an image. We just have to ensure that that tool follows all of the appropriate policies and procedures for our organization. The acquisition method for Mac, basically we're going to use a tool to capture the data. Black Bag Technology does sell acquisition products specifically for Mac items. Macquisition is a forensics boot CD that allows us to make images of a Mac drive. And then after making an acquisition, we can examine the image for whatever artifacts that we are then looking for. Just like with any other forensics disk, you are going to have to have tools for working with raw format disks. Black Bag, again, does have forensic software, but X-Way, Access Data, there are many tools out there that allow you to interact with a disk image. The first two tools can disable and enable disk attributions. Being able to turn off the mount function in a Mac OS is kind of important. This will allow you to connect a suspects that drive to a Mac without write blocking devices. However, again, following appropriate policies and procedures, you may want to just reinforce and double check. That way you don't accidentally overwrite data that you shouldn't. The same goes with our Linux. Most commercial uh, tools are used to analyze Linux's EX or XT2, 3, and 4 but also other variations of common Linux uh, structures. There's also freeware tools out there like the Sleuth Kit, and it's a web browser interface, Autopsy. There's a lot of other options out there for reviewing them. There are also tarballs, which is a data file containing one or more files or whole directories and their contents. Not, we're not going to say a zip or a compressed file, but I mean similar but not identical. So how do we install the sleuth kit or autopsy? Well it is predominantly for Windows however there are Linux variations. So basically you download it from the sleuth kit, you run the sleuth kit and autopsy browser and you can do that from a terminal. It gives you a local web interface and then you work through it. So in our textbook, there is an example of how to get it installed and examining a case for a Linux system using the autopsy and sleuth kit. And again, you walk through the web interface and you go through it. Uh, we have again, labs outside of our lecture that cover all of this components and then you fill out the description as a case as you'd be treating it as an actual case and you work through. And that is it for chapter seven. We talked about Unix and Linux, the kernels. We talked about the file system and the file structure. We talked about the hard link versus symbolic links. We talked about the different Mac OS file structures. We talked about a uh, file consisting of data forks and resource forks. We looked at defining a volume. We looked at uh, specific data types like the PS list. We looked at uh, logging and features within the Mac OS. We also looked at acquisition techniques. And lastly, we wrapped up with some Linux tools, freeware and autopsy. 
questions or concerns, please let me know. Thank you. All right, now that we've wrapped up some of the material for this chapter, are there any questions? There's a lot of different material covered. So again, the key thing is, as you're going through the material, whether it be the reading, whether it be the videos, ask questions, write questions down. The more that you can engage your brain in this material, the better you are at retaining the information. So again, questions, please feel free to, to reach out and we will go from there. Thank you and I look forward to working with you throughout the remainder of these modules.